Hey everybody, welcome to a brief introduction to Rust. In this video, I'll be showing you some of the highlights of the Rust language. We'll be going through its history and we'll have a code demo in which we will solve an exorcism exercise using Rust. And to top it all off, we will have some resources that you can use to learn Rust. So let's get started. Rust has been developed by Mozilla Research employee Graydon Hoare. Uh, after a while, it got adopted by Mozilla, and currently it is part of the Rust Foundation. Rust is a general purpose language that is targeted targeting systems programming. It is a strong and statically typed language, and uh, it has a focus on performance and reliability. It is a multi-paradigm language, which means that you can program in different styles in Rust. You can do imperative procedural programming. You can do object-oriented like programming. It's slightly different because, for example, there is no inheritance in Rust, but um, Vars has different ways in which you can sort of mimic uh, inheritance via traits. And it is um, very reminiscent to object-oriented programming in that you have information hiding and you have state, etc. cetera. Um, but you can also program in a functional way in Rust. And that's quite unusual for a systems programming language which are usually very, um, very fairly low level, but function program is very high level. So um, Rust combines these two worlds in a very neat way. When you compile Rust code, it actually doesn't compile to machine code directly. It compiles to LLVM. And LLVM has its own internal representation that Rust compiles to, and then LLVM does the actual translation to machine code. And one of the benefits of this is that Rust gets everything that LLVM supports, which is a ton of platforms, but also a ton of optimization. So um, a lot of stuff Rust gets for free by um, building on top of LLVM. One of the interesting facts of Rust is that it's very well loved. It has been the most popular language uh, of the Stack Overflow survey. So developers uniformly almost love it. And uh, it's starting to gain steam in that many new applications are built in Rust. Um, an example of this is SWC, which is used uh, in the JavaScript world as a compiler for JavaScript and TypeScript. And it's incredibly fast and is used by several big platforms. Um, another interesting thing is that the Linux kernel is written in C. And for years, that was the only language that you could use. Um, it's a high bar uh, that the C um, that the Linux kernel has, but they have supported uh, Rust from, I think, a couple of months ago. So you can now use Rust to write stuff in the Linux kernel, which is uh, an amazing achievement for the Rust uh, language. And then finally, um, I would like to mention that we also depend on Rust, on Exorcism. So if you submit a solution, we count the lines of code, and the tool that we use is Tokai, and Tokai is written in Rust, and it is incredibly fast, and it is extremely well made. So we depend on Rust too in our infrastructure. Let's go into some of the reasons why Rust is a great language. First and foremost, Rust is a very safe language. And with safe, I mean that Rust prevents you from making a lot of the mistakes that you could make in other systems programming languages. The Rust compiler is very strict. You have to be very explicit about how you handle your memory, etc., And that is one of the, the most common ways in which you can um, have mistakes occur when you mess up your memory management. You forget to uh, un deallocate something. You're referencing something that isn't there. Rust has systems in place, um, particularly the borrow checker, that, and we'll come back to that later on, that prevent you from making those mistakes. So Rust is a very safe language in that it doesn't allow you to make the mistakes that you might make in other languages. It also has a threat safety, so it's great for concurrency. Um, if you do need to write unsafe code, you can opt into that. So there, is, there are features in Rust that you allow you to write unsafe code, but it is not the default. You explicitly have to opt into them, um, but it can still be useful in some use cases. Um, an interesting thing about the safety of Rust is that all bindings slash variables are immutable by default. So usually in a systems programming language, you, mutability is the default, so you can uh, if you define a, a string or whatever, you can mutate it. You can do whatever you want with it. In Rust, that is not the default. So by default, you can't actually mutate things. You have to opt into that. And that gives you another level of safety. And it also allows the compiler to do certain optimizations, which is great for performance. Um, I've touched on this a bit, but the, the type system is incredibly powerful of Rust. 
So there is a ton of it that has it going for it. It has type inference. It has tons of great built-in types to deal with errors, etc. There is so much in the in the type system that helps you write safe and performant code. It's it's incredible, basically. Um, the compiler is also really helpful. Um, it is very strict, but it does give you very helpful error messages, and they are improving this uh, ongoingly. So the error messages get better and better and better. And one of the aims of the, the Rust team is to have it be as frictionless as possible. So um, they've already made uh, strides towards that goal, and they're still working on that. But the compiler giving you very helpful error messages is a big part of that. Um, Rust is also known for being very fast, and there are several reasons for that. One of them is the powerful type system and the fact that it is um, immutable by default and that there are certain guarantees that the compiler can give you that allow for certain optimizations to occur. Uh, but it's also due to Rust being very minimal. So the, the, the standard library and the language core are both fairly uh, small. So there isn't as much of a, a footprint if you run your Rust uh, code. It is a, a small uh, binary that you get and is very, very performant. Um, Rust also benefits from building on top of LLVM, which is highly optimized. So uh, in essence, Rust is a very, very fast language that is uh, performance-wise comparable to the best out there. It is also a be all batteries included language. So when you install Rust, you get a package manager, you get a build tool, you get the compiler, you get a formatter. So um, you get everything that you need from a modern language based on the installation that you do. So you, you get everything for free, basically. Uh, it also has great IDE integrations. So Rust is a modern language, so you can use it in a variety of IDEs, and they all have excellent integration with proper syntax highlighting and IntelliSense, et cetera, and all the things that you come to expect of a language. Um, the documentation is excellent. Um, it is well written. It is extensive. It is. Um, it's almost amazing how much documentation there is. There is documentation on almost everything. There is documentation about how to write unsafe code, on how the compiler is implemented. It is. Uh, there are so many resources that you could lose yourself for for years. I th I'd say almost. Um, but in general, the documentation is really good. They have examples with their uh, functions, etc. So. Uh, it really helps when you start to learn Rust that the documentation is just very good. Another great thing about Rust is that it's very portable. Um, it compiles to a single static binary, and there is no runtime. So you don't need to install anything on the machine to run Rust. It's just a, a static binary that you, um, that you ship to your platform, and then it should be able to run once you've compiled it for the right platform, of course. And uh, finally, there is easy interrupt with C code, of course, because um, the the systems that Rust targets um, all have code written in C usually. So you probably want to interface with C code, and Rust makes this very easy, and it tries to do this in a way that is safe-ish. Um, there's only so much that you can guarantee once you uh, cross the language barrier, but Rust tries to still have some of the the, the good, goodness of Rust uh, be applicable to the interrupt with C code. Let's discuss the standout features of Rust. These are the things that really make Rust shine. The first of them is zero cost abstractions. What is that? Well, an abstraction is something that you use in your code and it abstracts away a bit of logic for you. So you don't have to write it yourself. And this is all very useful because you don't have to bother with those uh, implementation details because the abstraction does it for you. It is uh, easier to work with the code and you become more productive. But there is a downside to using abstractions. And that is that it degrades performance because, well, an abstraction is a bit of code. So you have to run more code and more code to be run is bad for performance usually. So, but what Rust does is that it has zero cost abstractions. And that means that if you use these abstractions, which are really useful and pleasant to use and increase productivity, uh, you don't get the performance downside anymore because they are free. So if you would write a filtering option, uh, you could manually iterate over things and then filter it out, etc. Or you could use the built-in filter function, which is a higher level function. And there is no performance uh, downside to using that higher level function. They have the same performance. 
So I would highly recommend you using these abstractions in Rust because they increase your productivity, but you don't have the performance downside. So it's almost like you don't have to feel guilty about using these abstractions because you still get the, the performance that you'd like. Even It's equivalent to writing your own manual, highly optimized version. So just use the built-in abstractions and don't worry about the performance because Rust will handle it for you. The second standard feature is what Rust calls fearless concurrency. Um, traditionally, writing concurrent code is hard and it's very, very bug prone. So it's that all has to do basically with having different processes slash threads uh, working with the same data. So that's where things get hairy when you have two different things that are mutating the same value, potentially at the same time. So you would have uh, weird values. It might be in an, uh, an object, might be in an invalid state. So this is where concurrent programming becomes hard and you have to do a lot of hard work to, to fix those issues. You have logs, et cetera, which are bad for performance. But what Rust allows you to do is to do what they call fearless concurrency. So you don't have to worry about writing the right code because, well, basically it won't even compile if it isn't the right code. So the there is a thing that's called the borrow checker. And what that means is that Rust will guarantee that there is only ever uh, one owner of a value. So it means that only one object or process or whatever you name it can write a value at a time. So um, if you want another thing to write it, it has to become the owner first, and then the previous owner no longer is allowed to write to it. Um, you do have options of having multiple owners, etc. but this is the default. So by default, there's only one owner of a value, and that owner is the only one that can write to the value. And you can see why this is fantastic for concurrency, because you no longer have this concurrent updating of the value, so it all becomes a lot easier. And uh, pair this with Rust immutability and the fact that Rust has channels, it makes um, channels are a way of sending things between different processes. Um, it's all a, a very neat way of handling concurrency and Rust is excellent for doing that. So you can actually write your code and be fearless about concurrency because the compiler will have caught uh, almost any mistake that you could have made, like data raises, et cetera. They just don't occur because the compiler will prevent you from making those mistakes. The third and final standout feature that I'd like to mention is macros. Macros are a way of doing metaprogramming in Rust. And with metaprogram, you write code to generate code. Let's look at an example of how this works. Suppose you have a struct um, that has a name and an age, and you want to serialize that to JSON. Um, a library that could, imp could implement a macro to generate all the JSON serialization functionality for you. And um, so suppose we would annotate our struct with the macro. When the compiler then compiles our code, it will recognize that there is a, uh, a reference to a macro. And at compile time, it will run the macro. So the macro will receive the code that it was uh, annotating. So in this case, our struct definition, and it can then do uh, logic to to look at what is the structure of the struct, structure of the struct, and then it will generate all the relevant JSON serialization code for us at compile time. We don't have to write any of it ourselves. It will be built into the binary, uh, but macros are thus a way of running code at compile time uh, whilst receiving the original source code that it was applied to. And this is a, a very flexible way of adding functionality to different things. Um, you can support variable arguments, which is not something that you could do by default in regular functions, because they always have the same number of arguments. And um, macros are pervasive in Rust. Uh, a lot of the built-in things that you often use, for example, printing to the console or creating a vector, they are all defined as macros. And uh, many libraries allow you to uh, to use their macros to basically extend the language because they can generate code for you. So you can use like these mini DSL languages and they will generate the appropriate Rust code for you. So you only have to deal with the, the, the niceness of the macro without having to deal with any of the nitty gritty details of writing the actual code. And this makes Rust a very flexible language. 
And it's all part of the, the Rust concept of having a small core, but to have the language be extensible. And macros allow the language to be exactly that. Let's look at some actual Rust code. I'll be solving the isogram exercise of the Rust track on Exorcism. And the isogram exercise is about taking a string value and then it has to determine whether or not there is a repeating letter. So um, if you have the string ABC, then it's not an isogram because none of the letters repeat. But if you have AAB, then it isn't an isogram because there's two A's in that string. And that's what isogram uh, requires to implement. And we'll do that in Rust. Let's look at the starting point of the exercise. We have a single public function called check. Uh, the check function has a single parameter and uh, the type of that parameter is ampersand true, which means that um, it's a string slice, which is true. And the ampersand means it's a borrow. And a borrow means that we can read the value, but we can't mutate it. Uh, and that's fine for our purposes because we don't need to. Um, the function returns a Boolean, whether or not it is an isogram. And then within the function, there's it's we start with an unimplemented call. So uh, if we run all the tests, we should get failing tests. And we do. So that's all good. Um, we will solve this exercise in two different ways. We will start out with a very imperative version where we do manual iteration over the string and we'll do some bookkeeping and it will be very imperative. And, but the second version will be a more functional version. So we can compare these two approaches and see uh, what the benefits and downsides are of both and which one you like best. So let's get started. Let's implement the imperative version of our solution. Um, what we need to do is we need to iterate over the characters in the candidate string. And uh, before we do that, it's important to know that we are only working with ASCII input strings. So we don't need to deal with Unicode values. And that is really important because with ASCII, the, the letters are all single bytes, but uh, a, a single byte. Whereas with Unicode letters with maybe uh, dashes on them or whatever, they could be multiple bytes. And then we would have to use some different methodology, but we can sort of take a shortcut here because we know it is all in ASCII. So let's get to the iteration. We'll use a for loop. So for character in candidate dot, and then we'll use hars. Uh, by the way, the IDE that I'm using is C line, which is a JetBrains IDE that I really like. Um, you can use other IDEs too, and they should have a similar developer experience. It's just that C line is my preferred IDE. So um, we'll use hars. Um, that will return iterator over the characters in the string. So the character here is of type har. You can see that by the type annotation here. And um, the next thing that we need to do is we need to check if it actually is a letter. So if character dot, and then we'll uh, find the right method again. And it's actually the top one is else ASCII alphabetic. So if it is a letter, you can read that. Um, then we need to do our bookkeeping. So we now need to check, is this a letter that we've already seen before? And if not, we have to mark it as seen. And to me, that sounds like a, a set. And in Rust, there is a type for that, which is called a hash set. So we'll define a binding letters. It will be of type hash set har. And it, we have to initialize it, of course. So it will hash set colon colon new. And it doesn't compile yet because we need to import the hash set functionality. We can use the IDE for that just to be slightly lazy. Um, so at the top, you can see we now have a use statement to use the hash set um, type. Uh, so letters is now the thing that will hold all the characters, all the letters that we've already encountered. And we can then use that within this if statement. So we know it's a letter. We can now check, is it a letter that has already been processed? So if letters does dot contains the character, then um, what do we do? Well, it's, it can't be an isogram because it's a duplicate letter. So we can return false. Um, it doesn't compile yet. And there's a reason for that. If we hover over this, it will say mismatch types. It expected to be an ampersand char and found a car. So um, the contains function needs to temporarily borrow the character value. So we're saying, hey, you can temporarily start reading it. 
And um, so we have to prefix it with an ampersand. Um, that didn't really improve things, but that's because um, we haven't dealt with the fact that we have to return a Boolean value, but we don't do it uh, if this isn't true at any point. So at the end, we'll do return true. So that's all good. Um, and now compiles. So let's see, should it all actually work? Well, no, because we don't do anything to populate the letters. So um, if letters contains the character, return false. Otherwise, we can add the letter, which we do via insert. So we're going to say add the character to the letters. Um, only this is the next uh, error that we get. Can't borrow immutable local variable letters as mutable. And that's a fancy way of saying, hey, by default letters is something that you can't change. So insert changes the value. So we have to opt into being allowed to change it. So we have to opt into mutability. And to do that, you have to add the mut keyword. So now everything compiles because letters is mutable, which means that you can actually uh, call insert on it. And we can now run our uh, code and see if we get passing tests. And we get a lot of passing tests except for one. And that's the mixed case version, which makes sense because we haven't dealt with um, lower and uppercase letters being the same, being considered the same letter. So we'll do, uh, we'll introduce a lower letter binding and we'll have that be character dot to ASCII lowercase. So that's all fine. And then we have to replace character with lower letter. Let's rerun our tests and this should all work. So that's all fine. Um, there are two refactorings that we can do. We can um, omit the type here. So if we remove this, uh, the compiler will still be able to figure out that the type is hash set of har based on how this binding is used. So it knows that we are calling it with contains and with this value and lower data is a har and we're calling it with insert also with the har. So hash set must be of type hash set har. So that's really nice from the compiler. Uh, uh, another thing that we can do is instead of doing return true, we can remove the return because the last expression will always be return if it is, uh, if you get in this path. So we don't need to return. So let's rerun it and it still passes all the tests. So we have a working uh, imperative implementation of our logic. Then let's convert this to a more functional version. And um, we'll just put this in a common block and we'll start out the same way. So we start out with candidate.hars. Um, and then we'll have to do the rest, which is uh, this if statement, this if statement, etc. Uh, this converting to lowercase. And we're going to use higher level functions. So if we dot into what har is returned, there's a ton of stuff that we can use. But um, the first thing is that we want to filter out um, everything that's not, not a letter. So we want to only keep the letters. And we do that by using filter. So filter is a, fun is a function that takes a predicate. And the predicate is itself a function that takes a single argument and returns a boolean. Well, we could um, add a separate function, but we can also do an inline anonymous function, also called as a, also named a lambda, uh, with a special syntax. So we're going to say pipe, and then we'll say character. So that's our uh, our parameter, and then we'll do the body, and then the body is character dot is ASCII alphabetic. So this is um, a higher level function. And you can see this as internally doing like the for loop and then the if, but uh, we don't have to do deal with the actual for loop and uh, writing out the if is just a very concise way of writing the same thing that's being written here. And that's a very functional way to do. So we have a higher order function where we, we're passing a function to a function. So uh, if you're not used to that, um, it, it can take a little bit of time, but once you get used to it, it's very powerful and very easy to use. So the next step is we now have the letters. Uh, we need to convert the letters to lowercase. So we're going to do map and we do this. This is uh, similar that it also takes a, um, a lambda function. So this time we'll call it letter because we now know it is a letter. Um, and But map 
will basically uh, transform things. So we're going to say letter dot to ASCII lowercase, which is what we used before. So what this line does is it will transform everything that's in the result set in the iterator to uh, to lowercase. So once this has uh, finished, we have lowercase letters. And then we need to do the, the bookkeeping stuff, whether or not we've seen the character. Uh, we can use a little trick because what insert does is if you um, insert a value that's already there, it will return false. If it isn't already there, it will return true. And this is something that we can use uh, by using the all function. The all function takes a predicate, so letter, we have to return a boolean, and it will return true if all the invocations also return true. If a single invocation returns false, it will also return false. So that's precisely what we can do by having uh, letters dot insert and then the letter here. Uh, so the way you should read this is it will go over all the letters. If letters dot insert of the letter returns false, um, it will also return false. So that's precisely what we want. Um, we have a mixture of mutation and immutable pipeline here. Um, that's actually perfectly fine and Rust allows for that. And I think it's a very natural way of doing things in Rust. You, we could do this in a purely functional way, but I think it would be less readable than this version. So personally, I don't object to uh, combining these two, especially in Rust, because uh, Rust has a lot of guarantees that you don't mix things up so that you have errors. So I'm going to remove this, run the test, and this should still pass. So we have a, a functional implementation with a little bit of uh, mutation in it. Um, and personally, I think that's absolutely fine. Um, I like this functional pipeline uh, idea because it's, to me, that reflects the domain quite good because you have HARS, filtering, mapping, and then checking this all, although you could argue that this might be not the optimal way of doing things because you have to know the behavior of insert. Um, but it is suitable for this demo. Um, if you have a better way, please uh, put it in the comments and I'll, I'll happily read your code. And, um, but I, I think this is, this is nice and this is a functional way. And you can see that writing functional code in Rust is fairly natural and um, it won't have any of the downsides because we have the zero cost abstractions. So this will be virtually as uh, performant as the manual for loop. Um, in some cases, it could even be more performant, but uh, yeah, so try both approach and see which you like. Finally, I'd like to go over some of the resources that you can use to learn Rust. First of all, you can learn Rust on Exorcism. The Rust track on Exorcism has over 100 exercises, and it has a wide variety of topics that you can practice. Um, I would highly recommend you if you try and solve one of these exercises that you try out different approaches. One of the ways that makes programming in Rust fun is that it allows you to do things differently. So to try writing an, uh, immutable, uh, an immutable version with functional logic or try writing a mutable version with uh, imperative code or maybe try an object-oriented way. I would highly recommend you to try out these different ways of writing things because it gets you, gives you a good feel for what Rust allows you to do. And also you can find out what your preference is. Maybe you find out you like the functional approach in Rust uh, a lot, or maybe you like the object-oriented features. Go try it out. Um, if you want to learn the Rust language itself, you can also go to the Rust programming language book. It's also known as the D-book. And it's basically a comprehensive uh, listing of everything that's in the language. So you can learn basically anything that is in the Rust language by reading the Rust programming language book. Um, you can also use Rust by example. And these are, it's sort of similar to the Rust programming language book in that it, it covers all the, the different concepts in the language, but it is somewhat different in that it has these runnable examples. So uh, suppose we click on primitives here. Um, there is um, a runnable code here. So you can run this and it will say, hey, this is running. And then you get a compilation error. And then you can see why you need to fix some things, it will be very interactive compared to the book, which is more, well, it's a book, so it isn't really interactive. And this can also be a great way to learn Rust. And with that, we've reached the end of the video. I hope this has been a useful video 
and that you've been encouraged to try out Rust. Um, and hopefully we'll see you soon at the Rust track on Exorcism. Bye.